50 years ago, a new baby was born into the world. Leaders from six European nations joined together to play midwife at the birth of a new Europe. Since then, their baby has grown bigger, some would say fatter, than its parents could ever have imagined. But what does this new Europe stand for, and why is faith important to its future? I'm Mal Fletcher, and this is Edges. The leaders who signed the Treaty of Rome back in March 1957 hoped to bring unity and prosperity to a part of the world that had been at the epicenter of two unimaginably horrific world wars. The architects of the European Economic Community, the EEC, hoped that by bringing nations together, first for trade and then for policy, they could end the strife that had started in their backyard but had scarred the world. Today, the EEC has morphed into the European Union, the EU. It's an experiment in government that's unique in history. Officially, the EU likes to say it's about things like defending democracy and social freedoms and justice. But I think for most Europeans, the success or failure of the EU will be judged by much more practical things. Today, European citizens can travel across Europe without being too bothered by pesky things like passport controls. And while they're traveling, at least within the three quarters of Europe covered by the Eurozone, they can buy things in a single currency avoiding all the old hassles of money exchange. Of course, not everybody's delighted with the euro. In countries like Britain, Sweden and Denmark, it's still seen as something of a threat to national sovereignty and identity. But it's Europe's young people who've been the quickest to adopt the new European identity. More than two million of them have already relocated from one centre to another, like here in London, to pursue their studies, often with EU funding. So it's not hard to wonder if even in nations outside the Eurozone, the emerging generations won't eventually see more pros than cons with this single currency. But are attitudes in those hesitant countries like Britain starting to change towards the Euro? Well, I'm here in the capital's busiest shopping street to find out. Excuse me, sir, what do you think of the Euro and why? Well, it's, it's great and because you can travel. Quite handy when you're travelling abroad, but I don't want it here. <laughs> I can see there are benefits uh, to both sides, really. But personally, I like to, I, I'm quite out, outward looking and I would like the Euro. I feel a bit afraid of losing our identity. The currency changes and it goes down. That's, oh, we will lose that and get less pay as well, won't we? Price increase a little bit, but um, you get a feeling like uh, un unity in Europe. It's very confusing, and I think it, more than anything, I think we should at least keep something for Britain, because then it was in everything for Europe. So I'd like to see them do what they're doing for us. It's about bringing all of Europe together, and I think that we can't in the long run stand out against that. A real mix of opinion there, but I have to say I am surprised by the amount of people that I asked who said that they thought the Euro was a good thing. Granted, a lot of them were tourists, but many people talked about moving forward and not being left behind. On the world stage, Europe's at the forefront of efforts to preserve the environment, to tackle terrorism and to reduce global crime. But it's in the area of finance that Europe's become a real powerhouse. You have to remember that Europe was receiving financial aid just over 50 years ago, but today it offers more worldwide humanitarian assistance and development aid than just about any other region on Earth. So the EU can claim its fair share of successes, not the least of which is the peace it has brought. But there are some major challenges ahead. One of the biggest has to do with the way the EU is governed. 
Europe claims to be one of the great champions of liberal democracy, but just how representative is the EU itself? There are three major bodies at the top of the EU structure. The European Parliament, the European Council and the European Commission. But only the Parliament is directly elected by the people. Every five years Europeans go to the polls to elect their representatives. Well that's the theory anyway. In reality it seems most Europeans are not sufficiently engaged in the great European experiment to actually be bothered casting a vote. Perhaps that's because of a common perception, right or wrong, that EU bureaucrats are accountable to nobody but themselves, that they're good at meddling in other people's affairs while bungling their own. To be fair, the structure of the EU is still evolving, but over the next few decades Europe will have to decide whether it moves closer to becoming a superstate, a kind of United States of Europe, or whether it remains a confederacy of true nation states. And it will have to engage the voter at every stage in that process.